This is Real News Media TV, coverage you can trust. Please like, share, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. Select all for daily news updates. Third Money College of Fumes Victim Dies The third victim of the Money College septic tank noxious fumes incident has died. Beres Fort Gordon, 46, of a church pen road address in Spanish Town, St. Catherine, died this morning at the St. Anne's Bay Regional Hospital after being admitted in an unconscious state yesterday. Gordon's co-workers from Central Cesspool, Kirk Kerr, 46, of Shelter Rock, Spanish Town, and Jocelyn Henry, 56, of Riverly, Spanish Town, both died yesterday after being knocked unconscious by noxious fumes coming from a septic tank they were cleaning at the college. It is reported that after pumping the waste from the tank, one worker went in with a shovel to dislodge hardened waste matter. However, he was severely affected by the fumes, prompting one co-worker at first, then the other to descend into the tank to assist, but both also got into difficulties. The police were called and with assistance from the Jamaica Defense Force personnel from the nearby Monique training camp and firemen, the men were retrieved. Kerr and Henry died at the scene while Gordon was rushed to the hospital. He passed away early this morning. Appeals for help as 18 homeless after Manchester fire. For over 40 years, the seven-bedroom dwelling located in the Coleville community in the parish was the only home the family of 18 knew. But last Thursday, they lost everything after fire gutted their dwelling, leaving them with only the clothes they had on their backs. A victim of the fire, Zania Robinson, said she was away from home when the fire started, noting that it was her sister who alerted those at the house to the impending danger. Thursday morning, they were home and my sister saw the smoke and the fire and shouted out, Fire, fire! All know we don't know how the fire started. The 26-year-old said they tried to save items from the burning building, but the structure, made of concrete and board, was soon fully engulfed and saving lives became the main priority. My mother was trying to grab some things, but when she realized that her elderly cousin would burn up in the fire, she had to drop everything and run out with him. He is bedridden and wouldn't be able to save himself. Previously, struggling to make ends meet, as a result of the harsh economic climate compounded by the pandemic, Robinson said she has no idea when her family will be able to recover from this disaster. Life was hard enough. It was very rough for us. We were doing our little farming, and sometimes we would go to the coronation market to sell. Some days we didn't really have any food to eat, but we were still pressing on. Now we have lost everything. This is the home where my mother, Donna White, grew up, and the same for my siblings' children. This is the only home we know, she said, as her voice sank. Robinson said among the items that, that perished were the back-to-school supplies for the children. Tablet, books, everything burned up. Even our cell phones burned up, so I don't even know how school will go. It was six bedrooms, a kitchen, and we had an outdoor bathroom. But now everything is gone, everything. Since the incident, members of the family have been granted a temporary accommodation at the Coleville Seventh-day Adventist Church, but are hoping to secure other living arrangements as soon as possible. The church has said one week, but I believe they have extended it, and we are grateful. The main need right now is assistance with food and clothes, and we are trying to make other arrangements, especially for the children. Over time, we want to get back our home. It is going to take some time to rebuild, and we are hoping that we will get some help and it will work out, she added. Robinson said as her relatives struggle to pick up the pieces, they are trying to remain positive despite the circumstances. We try not to think about the loss because we have life. We just want to know the children especially are okay, that they have food and they are taken care of. We can't dwell on the stress. We are just hoping for brighter days and hoping we get some assistance so we can get back on our feet, she said. To offer assistance to the family, call Zanai Robinson at 876-325-0244. Beware when handing lawyers money, public warned. 
Members of the public, especially those who will be entrusting lawyers who practice on their own with large sums of money, are being encouraged to make serious inquiries about how their monies will be managed before retaining one. That is the advice from Attorney Alan Wood QC, Chairman of the General Legal Council, which is the regulatory body for lawyers. It comes against the background that many clients have encountered problems in trying to recover their monies from lawyers, especially those who operate on their own when they die or fall ill. In some instances, the funds cannot be found. This issue, Wood explained, is partly due to a lack of due diligence by many clients before engaging a lawyer. They all need to realize that they have bargaining power and that there is nothing wrong in making certain inquiries of an attorney, he said. In carrying out their due diligence, Wood said clients should visit the GLC's website to check if the particular lawyer is up to date with and has a history of filing an accountant's report which they are to submit annually once they handle monies from clients. Clients should also check if the lawyer is current with his or her practicing license. If you are engaging a sole practitioner, an inquiry needs to be made about what will happen to my money or what happens to my business if you fall sick. Is there anyone who is going to carry on the practice? Is there anyone who is going to be able to access the money to pay me out? Wood added. For example, he said, if a client is going to give an attorney a sole practitioner a house sale and $10 million to $20 million is going to be paid to that attorney, the client should be able to sit down with the attorney and discuss where is my money going to be held and if something happens to you, you fall sick or you die, how do I get my money? And is there anybody on the account who will be able to draw on the account? Clients should also find out whether the lawyer has professional liability insurance should anything go wrong. The GLC chairman highlighted that in many of the cases that he has seen involving a deceased or sick sole practitioner, the council has been burdened with the task of investigating where the lawyer maintained bank accounts, whether there were any other signatories on the accounts, or if the council needs to get an order from the court for the money to be paid out. Much of that can be avoided if the client, at the time of engaging, take precautions to ensure that there are things in place to avoid this type of problem, Wood said. He noted that lawyers are required to indicate in the accountant's report where the client's funds are being held and whether there are signatories on the account, but in some instances, attorneys do not file their reports promptly or at all. We also had a case, strangely enough, where the attorney had clients' money and the clients couldn't be located, and there was no information available out of the attorney's practice from the documents we saw to be able to locate these clients, and we tried to trace them but we couldn't, Wood stated. In cases where the money is found and can be traced to the client, the counsel will pay over the money to the client, he said. However, Wood said, in some cases that we have had, the money can't be located. In one instance, there was a significant shortfall where we could not locate in excess of $20 million. We just can't find it. Illegal guns seized in St. Catherine Police Operations Cops in the St. Catherine South Police Division have seized three illegal guns in five days during targeted operations. The exercise started last Friday in the Portmore Municipality. Among the weapons seized was a submachine gun as the police conducted operations in Nagahead on Port Henderson Road and in Myrtle Lane, Superintendent Hopeton Nicholson told the news. We have increased the number of operations across the division. We have been going into various communities, especially what we regard as hot spots, pursuing intelligence as it comes to us, Nicholson added. He added that criminals across the division are being pursued. We will continue the operational thrust in the municipality of Portmore, in Central Village, and in the Old Harbor subdivision, he said. Nicholson, who is in charge of operations in the police division, appealed to residents to cooperate with police personnel. Some may suffer a little inconvenience, but we ask for cooperation, the passing of information whether through 911 or the nearest police station. While in Kingston, one 0.45 semi-automatic pistol 
with a magazine containing five 9mm rounds of ammunition, was seized by the Kingston Eastern Police following a shooting incident on Bobo Hill, Bull Bay, St. Andrew, on Monday, September 6. Reports are that about 3.50 p.m., lawmen were in the area when two men along the roadway, whose actions aroused their suspicions. On seeing the police, the men fired shots at the police team. The police team returned the fire and the men ran, leaving the weapon behind. No member of the police team was injured. No one was arrested in relation to this seizure. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe and hit the notification bell. Select all for daily news updates.